and Hi. hello. Hello, Helga. How are oh, you? Oh, wow. How about this day? So it's raining where you are. It's raining where I am. It's, it's not even, it's not just rain. It's tropical storm Faye. Faye is visiting mm, us. Faye is visiting. Wow. It's 114 here. So we're <laughs> in nice extremes. <laughs> what is that even? 114 exactly. degrees. I don't know. I don't know. But, but um, this is our eighth master class together wow. our 16th discovery in the festival wow. and today i'm i'm really i'm thinking a lot about something that you said to me yesterday um which relates to this question that we always ask each other uh, about how we're doing and and you you spoke to something of a covid layer cake and i have to say that stayed on my mind all day you know this idea of um that covid is the cake yeah we're all consuming and that then on top of that, we have all the other layers yeah. of unemployment, of, of what are we, how do we get our groceries, of can we afford to do this or that thing this month? Right. And those, those are the layers. How do we care for our kids? How do we care for ourselves? Yep. Those, those are the layers. And then in relation to today, you know, I've been thinking, you know, how can these movements that you know that 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 we're going to and have been talking about in terms of anti-racist you know structural reform and the me too movement run side by side and how they must run side by side and how these questions really are kind of the foundation um this kind of rub you know uh is is really at the foundation of of our country you know if you look all the way back to frederick Douglass and susan b anthony you know those questions were being asked then right. and i just uh, i i hope um and I question, you know, whether America has the moral um, and spiritual strength to move through these uh, movements together and, without yeah. leadership. <laughs> so I, I'm sorry, but you know, these are the COVID cake went just it was a good it was a good metaphor. But it's a great day that we have here to um, to have some music and to have music yes. with this particular artist. Yes. Uh, will you tell us a little bit about her? I sure We're will. We're here with Lara St. John. Yes. So our guest today, um, Lara St. John, is the Juno Prize winning violinist that's been described as something of, phenomena, of, of a phenomenon by the Strad and a high powered soloist by the New York Times. She's performed as a soloist in countless orchestras across the world and founded her own label in 1999. Um, in 2019, she was named by Alex Ross and the Rest is Noise as the Person of the Year, and she's also known for being fearless in her role uh, in the Me Too movement and in bringing conservatories to their knees in terms of their complicity. Um, she created the We Believe You Solidarity Concerts held for classical music sexual, sexual assault victims and for all female musicians um, who suffered abuse in the classical music community. Uh, we're going to talk a little later about her recent album, but it's called Key of A. It was released with pianist Matt Herskovitz, um, and it's been called Charismatic, Full-Blooded, and an Impressively Original Release. Um, so, Lara, please join us. Hi. 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 It's good to see you. Yeah, again. so nice to be here. <laughs> Thank you. So we always start these conversations by asking our guests how they are. How are you? <laughs> what a loaded question these uh -huh. days. Um, actually, quite, quite well, um, considering. I, tell uh, us why. Well, I've, I think I've actually managed to kind of come out a little bit with a, a, a little bit of a bouquet of flowers from, from the COVID thing. Um, I've tried to, I mean, at first, I think like everybody else, I was like, oh my gosh, the world is ending. And, you know, I had this sort of, a little bit of depression, uh, this and that, but ended up actually going going back to school at New York Film Academy for a month, mm. and um, you know, just doing things that because of my travel schedule before, I would never have been able to do. So in a way, I like to try to try to stay positive, although although it is it is a little tough, as you said. You know, there's always that bit of cake, and um, I'm trying to put some icing on it. I guess I don't know how to quite uh, keep going with that metaphor. <laughs> But um, yeah, I mean, I worry actually more about uh, colleagues of mine, you know, especially uh, in orchestras on Broadway. Um, everybody's just on tenderhooks to see what's going to happen at the end of this month. And, and I'm, I'm especially, especially worried for 
basically all my friends, all my musician friends and artist friends. And it's just, it's, it's a terrible situation and we're going to be the last to become, to be coming back. Right. And it's, it's, well, you guys know it's scary yeah. as hell. <laughs> it is. It's, it's the unknown, I think, which is really hard to deal with. You know, I think as artists, we all deal with a certain level of abstraction and unknown, but not right. to this degree. Yeah. Um, so I think there's a lot of uh, rewiring, you know, that yeah. that's needing to happen in order to, to, to function. And mm-hmm. that it's all happening at the same time. Right, right. Right. So it's not one crisis and then you deal with that and then you go to the next crisis and you it's no, it is everything together. And it takes a tremendous amount, I think, of of centeredness and of us coming together Mm -hmm. and being able to support one another uh, that will get us through. But as you said, you first had to have your moment of depression and of Mm -hmm. meltdown before (laughs) you had enough buffer and enough sustenance within yourself to say, you know what, I can, I can now, I have space to worry about my people and my, and how, how they're faring. Well, yeah. And obviously I, like everybody else would much rather be, be working and doing what we always did than, than sort of taking a course for a month. But you know, it, 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 at least trying to so super have glass half full, there have been a couple of things that otherwise I wouldn't have been able to do. So I think we can all kind of say that. And it is hard to keep at least one bit of positivity every day. But uh, I have mm-hmm. found that that really helps me get through the day. And I like that idea. One piece yeah. of positivity a day. Yeah. You know, today, uh, we're going to get into several different strands of your incredible life. Um, and but we're going to start with music. And I'm excited uh, by your selections. And I wonder if you we like to kind of dive right into the music and then let that serve as the bed for discussion. So maybe tell us about what we'll hear. And, uh, and let's, let's, let's have the treat of listening to you. Well, first selection, just because, uh, well, he's just so great. Um, (laughs) (laughs) uh, A little uh, last movement from the Sonata in C Major by Johann Sebastian Bach. This is the Allegro Asai um, from one of his solo violin sonatas. I'll just stand up. Wonderful. So Helga, I'm going to, I'm going to just listen. Yeah, me too. All right. Thank <laughs> you. 
And that right there <laughs> is the truth. Wow. There's, there's, there's your, po- your positivity. <laughs> yes. It's a very, a very, exuberant, very exuberant movement of his. So I thought it would be a good starting piece. <laughs> right, but it's not just the exuberance of, of the music. It is, it's all that it, it also takes yes. for you to, to play it. So mm. all the breath all your body it's like it uses every every aspect yeah elemental part of your beast brilliance <laughs> and i and i hope it's a lot of calories yeah <laughs> bring it it's <laughs> great um why why did you want to start there mm. well because i i feel like it's just such a it, it's so ebullient and so yeah I don't know. It's it's like musical uh, champagne, <laughs> in a in a in a great and very deep way, obviously. But uh, it's obviously the 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 great man himself at a at a very sort of happy moment of his life. Um, mm. I mean, he seemed to have had quite a few of those, along with uh, you know the the Chaclons and the D minors that that he and the the Saint John Passions. <laughs> so um, uh, I just wanted to start with that. <laughs> and now for something completely different. <laughs> right. So we go from like this kind of spirituality and exuberance into Melissa Dumphy, right? Yeah. Melissa is a um, actually a half Chinese, half Greek Australian. So an uh, immigrant in every way who now lives in uh, Philadelphia. And um, she has written a piece for solo violin called komos. And komos is a Greek word for beating, as in the chest in lamentation. Mm. And apparently it is a lyrical song that occurs in tragic theater, in Greek tragic theater, when the tension of the play rises to a climax of um, grief or horror or joy. So, and two sides of the same coin in a way, uh, right? A little bit. Yeah. And she said that she, she wrote this piece when she was, uh, when she was exiting from a period of depression and, and started feeling all the feelings again, you know, like Mm. the, the, the despair and the grief and the calm and the and the happiness and you know so it's uh i think that really exudes exactly that in this in this uh, little piece and, of uh, 
Lara, tell us just uh, real quick what you're playing on for people who don't know who are listening. Okay. And we have a lot of people on Facebook listening and just tell us a little bit about your instrument. And also, gotcha. have you played this piece um, elsewhere? Uh, Comos? Yes. Yeah, I've done it a couple of times at, uh, especially at um, some of the, you know, We Believe You concerts and stuff. Okay. So that's, okay. um, yeah, this is actually, this is a JV Guaranini from uh, Turin, Italy, um, made in 1779. Wow. So, um, Sometimes when I'm doing a Beethoven sonata or concerto or something, I'll, I'll tell the audience, well, you know, I mean, just to sort of to rapproche, to, to, to uh, uh, not reproach, to approach sort of that era, if you think mm -hmm. about it, when this was being built, Beethoven was nine. And so it's perfectly plausible that he would have heard it in his lifetime. And wow. so it kind of like just makes it, I don't, to sound a little kid, just like a living link with the power. Yeah, yeah, it gives it different <laughs> ears. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. So anyway, it's a great fiddle. I'm very, very lucky to have it. This is Comos by okay. Melissa Dunphy. Okay.
that is incredible. Melissa <sighs> Dumphy for, for it's, it's, it's so incredible always to me to discover another phenomenal voice. And um, thank you for that. Yeah, I think so too. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Oh, that's incredible. Yeah. Yeah. Breathe. Yeah. We can, we can, we need a moment to breathe too. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. Really, really great piece. And, Phenomenal. Uh, and just four to five little minutes. Uh, so mm, many and emotions. It's, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's so big. Um, as you're breathing, mm. it, yesterday we talked a little and when we had that that time together, the three of us, um, you know, about what it took. And I, and I feel like this Dumphy piece, Melissa Dumphy piece is such a, is such a good way into this conversation in terms of it taking a zeitgeist, um, you know, for, for you to name these things and, and for these kind of cries for justice. Um, and a lot of what Helga and I talk about in these master classes is modeling. You know, how do we model through these incredible minds and talents, um, ways for others? And specific to sexual abuse, there's so many people who have remained silenced. And I wonder if we can talk a little bit about, you know, either remain silenced or forced to be silent, um, just about your journey into, um, <laughs> into this last year and where you're at right now. Uh, for those, you know, who don't know, um, maybe just a little yeah. entry. Um, almost exactly a year ago, actually, I think um, it came out July 25th of 2019. Um, I had been working on with um, Peter Dobrin and Trisha Nadolny from the Philadelphia Inquirer, uh, a sort of a, a very long, it turned out being a 5,000 word article, um, which ended up on the front page of the, of the Sunday Philadelphia Inquirer about how um, I was abused and raped at the age of 14 by my teacher at the Curtis Institute, um, how I reported it at 15 with two witnesses and was um, basically mocked by the then Dean, Robert Fit Fitzpatrick, and um, laughed at basically and told, oh, well, who do you think anyone's gonna believe? You know, some kid or somebody who's been with this venerable institution for decades. And at the time, of course, I was a, a very scared and, and, and poor 15 year old girl. And so of course, I, uh, I, I just, I just said, all I want is to just change teachers. And, mm -hmm. and then I thought it was the most incredible thing when, when I wasn't actually punished or kicked out, you know, at Curtis, you're always on probation, they call it. Um, so I was just so grateful that I wasn't basically, yeah, kicked out for having been raped. <laughs> uh, I, I don't mean to, it's just so preposterous. It's so you know, looking back that I say that, that um, I, I sometimes like almost laugh. Anyway, um, fast forward 34 years. And as, as we were saying yesterday, it did kind of take a little bit of the Me Too zeitgeist to help me finally want to come public and to ideally help others um, who, of course, as we all know, there are way too many people in this situation. Um, I'm just one person, so I tend to concentrate on abuse in music schools and conservatories, but I'm sure, you know, we all know about Catholic Church, about Penn State, about so many other schools. Mm. About uh, our own families. Uh, yes, sometimes that happens. I've, uh, I've done some work with Child USA, and some of the stories are, they're, they're so heart-wrenching that it's, uh, you know, it's almost impossible. But at least, um, you know, I thought that by becoming uh, public about it, it, it could help some people. And, and I think it certainly has. Um, I heard from it, dozens, if not hundreds of people, basically just me too, me too, me too, me too. Mm -hmm. And I actually took the impetus to go and, and speak to quite a lot of them. I took trips. I took a trip to Texas. I went over to, to Holland, to England, to uh, uh, all over the place and, and just sort of sat face to face with these people, some of whom were telling their stories for the first time. And I mean, that really made me feel like it was kind of all worth it just, just for those few people who, who finally you know, we're able to, one person said she'd never told anyone. It was actually the same teacher as me. And she was even younger than me. And um, she said she had never even told her parents or anything. And, and finally was able to, she said it was a, just a big load lifted off 
off her shoulders at last. And you know, if 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 this, if if me talking about it like crazy can can help people, then I am willing to talk about it like crazy and let me be your punching bag. And but, what uh, has what has the outcome been, you know, in terms of both Curtis but also, you know, other conservatories, because there's so many there's such a culture of power in conservatories that, um, like all cultures of power, are mm -hmm. resistant to being challenged. Um, how, you know, how what what was the aftermath, and what do you continue to see as you know, you know, as the aftermath, especially in this kind of COVID sta stasis, um, in regards to this movement. Well, I think I, what I worry about is that it's a little bit taken a backseat thanks to COVID, and I don't want that to happen, obviously, although it's, it, it, it does make some sense because at the moment, nobody's having lessons or going to class. So, you know, there is that, but there's, there's still the case that things are going to eventually get back to normal, and we can't have them get back to normal, not in the way that conservatories think is normal. Right. Um, in the case of Curtis, um, they... <laughs> really did a very weird bunch of things by when the article first came out, they wrote an email to all of their alumni, which is a considerable amount of people, which actually included my own brother, very sweet of them, and told them to shut up and don't talk to anyone. And so of course that backfired spectacularly. They had to apologize for that. Then they wrote something saying, we do the minimum required by law. So, you know, we are, we are indemnified. We don't have any fault. And this was all so long ago and et cetera, et cetera. And um, they've basically uh, done a very bad job of dealing with um, the situation, I would mm -hmm. say, um, in, in pretty much every way. So after holding their feet to, fire, to the fire for quite a few months, actually, it took from July to, I believe, uh, November before they actually finally decided to get an outward uh, um, uh, outdoor, or what, what do you call that? Like a uh, statement? Yeah, like a, a report done by someone right. who was not inner to them, right. which is what they in 2013 when this first came to the to um, to the wow. well, this was when I this it's a it's kind of maybe a too long story for this, but uh, I did write a nine page letter to the director. Um, at the time, who is uh, still the director now. And um, so he knew about this, commissioned a report, um, which uh, only talked to two people, not me, not the witnesses, um, just um, the then director and the then dean, and um, didn't even say anything about anything. And basically, they buried it and wouldn't give it to me or the inquirer um, last year. And so this time, it's an actual transparent report being done by a law firm which is very well regarded and so, that's still in process it is still in process it is it has taken a while it started in november and of course you know things have slowed since since the the pandemic but uh, but i'm i'm hoping that it, at the very least this transparency comes out and and also that it that it teaches other schools you know the the me too things that came to me, the, the, the thousands, well, hundreds of emails and, and messages on, on Facebook. Um, there's, uh, I mean, University of Michigan, there's a guy there, Stephen Ships, 40 solid years of complaints. I heard from 10 people that had had, that had complained about him over 40 years. And only now did they finally get rid of him last year. Mm -hmm. And only, and now there's supposedly there's an FBI investigation. I have no idea what's happening. He's as far as I know, having a great time at home playing with his cats. Um, after 40 years of University of North Carolina, of Metamount, of UMish. Right. And I'm sorry, but that's not right. I don't care who you are, not at anybody's book. Is that okay? And, and I just, it, there's p p problems with Juilliard, there's uh, Cheatham's in London, there's a Royal Academy, there's, I mean, I heard from all of these people, and of course, people are scared. Mm -hmm. They're scared because they know that that the there's, there's a, well, a, a patriarchy, which is still right. in power, and that it may affect their careers, especially if they're younger. Why do you <laughs> think you aren't scared? Mm, well, I mean, question. I'm, well, first of all, I'm not at an upward, well, I mean, hopefully we're always at an upward trajectory in our careers, but um, I'm, I'm at that point. I'm not 25. You know, I'm not just starting out. I'm not somebody that, that anybody can beat down at this point. And I think that's why I'm not scared. It, it took me this long to, I mean, think about it. It took me 34 years to report this in public. 
Mm. And not only that, it took a zeitgeist and it took a movement and it, and it took a lot of people before I was actually mentally able to do such a thing. And, and even that, you know, it was, it was costly, I have to say. In, in costly in here and costly musically. Can you talk about the sacrifice? Because musically, no, but just, I mean, mentally, yes, it, mm -hmm. it, it, it cost a lot, but I think it's, uh, it was definitely worth the price <laughs> to, to continue with that metaphor. But uh, I can understand people who stay, who stay quiet, who right. are, uh, who are younger, who, who, who maybe don't have the, you know, it used to be big school, little girl. Now it's big school, big girl. Right. <laughs> and, and knowing that I was, I was finally like, okay, this is time. It's time for me to stand up for those who can't stand up for themselves. Lara, what does good look like? And I asked that because I want good. We want good. You know, how does, how does good look like in a, in a, in a world where power, um, power doesn't recede easily? <laughs> it's going to take a, a a massive change this November, I think, for this country, um, because at the moment that I believe that that is seen as totally permissible. Mm -hmm. I mean, you've right. got a guy who's like the commander in chief who's cheated on all his wives and has, well, I don't know, 55 uh, allegations of abuse. And, and apparently that's fine. Nothing happens to him. And I think people see that and they think, well, like I can get away with it, too. And you can see that in the reaction of these schools is that the last thing they want to do is give up any of that. What they, I mean, they just want, they want me to go away mm. and they want this to go away. And such as, as Juilliard and, and all these other ones. I mean, I think they're probably scared and they're just kind of like, Ooh, let's hope we don't get one of her. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it may be so that they don't because it, it being it costs be, being a victim is a it's it's very 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 hard and it's a lifetime of of a, a whole different trajectory that your life takes and one of my big big advantages um being a, a rape victim is that i am not dead um, a lot of, of people and a, a lot of people who I heard from whose relatives or, or uh, it, one in particular, a fiance, um, are dead by their own hand because the depression and the guilt is, is so massive and so real after, after such a thing happening, especially, as you know, with, with, with priests and teachers, it's, it's someone in a position of power. It's someone in a position of trust. Mm. And that's why it's, it's even... Well, I mean, you can't compare bads, but it's just a very bad thing that someone you're, you've put on a pedestal and you're meant to trust and respect does something like that and uses that as an advantage. And that, that is a terrible thing. I believe Dante had somewhere in the ninth circle of hell for, uh, for people right. who betrayed trust. Laura, do you feel alone in this fight or is there a network of like a networked effort, anything um, that that has supported you in this or that you see as a potential bridge to, um, you know, to, to a better side of this? I certainly have heard from, as I, as I mentioned, a lot of people and not even me too people, but um, folks that I didn't even know from the music field and everything, just writing to me saying like with so much support. Mm -hmm. And I actually wasn't expecting that. I would say that the response was 97% positive or Supportive. supportive. I mean, obviously not positive, but, but, you right. know, oh, we're so glad you did this, you know, keep on going. This is great kind of thing. Um, the other 3%, you know, they're trolls, whatever you have to just like right. water off a duck's back. But um, so that, that was very enheartening. And so I do feel quite, quite supported and, and not necessarily, ne necessarily alone in this, in this, in this battle, maybe war. <laughs> Against, where is it where it. is it inside your your body in terms of how you use your body with your instrument mm. so it's it's that kind of violence against the body mm. uh, i would imagine is also somehow connected to your style of playing which is also very physical and how are they in communication with one another does one soothe the other? Are they, are they for you related at all? It's, it's actually a very good question and an interesting one. A, a lot of people who reached out to me no longer play 
because of this thing. And I, I find that very, very sad because they had to give up something, something that they love was ruined. And for me, I think I've, I've thought about this quite a bit. I started so young. I was two and a half when I began playing what must have been like a mouse sized <laughs> violin and it can't have sounded good. But to me, playing the violin, it's a medium. It's, it's kind of like a language. Like you don't really think of how you create a sentence in your, in your native tongue. And it's sort of the same for me. I don't really think about it. And I think that I was enough established by the time I was 14 with my own voice that when this happened to me, I was, I was able to get past it musically. Like I never, you know, in, in the sense that for other people who might not have yet been quite as married to their instrument as, as I was at that point, um, somehow this didn't ruin it for me. And I am eternally thankful for that, obviously, but uh, it's not really, it's hard to explain how that would be the point, but, or how that would be the case. But I'm, I'm very, very glad that it is, and, and I feel bad for others. But yeah, I mean, obviously, there's a sense of, I guess I call it sort of being stunted, because at that time, it was, um, I was emotionally stunted after I was 14, and, and obviously educationally, because it's kind of hard right. to learn when you're borderline suicidal. Right. <laughs> exactly traumatized and um and I, I left that school in philadelphia as soon as i possibly could and i got as far away as i possibly could which that at that time was the soviet union so not only an ocean and a continent but i put a wall between us too <laughs> so and that was a, a, a terrific decision of mine and i think it saved my life wow wow so, yeah anyway this is incredible because i think you know i think what's hard as problem solvers is to understand that cracks in the system don't break a system immediately they are exactly that they're cracks and mm -hmm. they're important and that the single voice is important that it can make change but that it doesn't make change overnight um in something that feels and there's so many of these issues as helga said in this COVID layer click um that just feels so inhuman um, and that it not be able to be solvable right away is maddening. But I am, I know we are very grateful for your cracking this system because it needs to be cracked and it needs to be, um, this revolution needs to happen. Well, it power is, is not easily taken away. So. No. And I mean, you can, I can understand that if I were in a position of power, if I was a, a king, I wouldn't want somebody trying to unseat me either, but you know, it, it has to be done. And I have to say that um, the, the whole Black Lives Matter movement and everything, I mean, I know it's a very different injustice, but in a way, I feel like this is going alongside yeah. my, my, my thing as well. Um, it's basically people taking advantage of the vulnerable. Um, and although it's different, there's a lot of similarity. So absolutely. I'm, I'm like, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. When I was I was talking to Helga at the very top about, you know, Frederick Douglass and Susan B. Anthony, um, and he talked about, you know, when he ran away from slavery, it was from himself. Um, when he advocated emancipation, it was for his people. But when he stood up for the rights of women, his self was out of the question. It was really about finding nobility in the act. And I think that there's something for, you know, white people right now to th these issues there. We're all fighting them together. We have to be comfortable in this discomfort. Um, you know, whether it's a gender based question, whether it's a, a, a racial question, it's it's a moment of truth. It's a it's cracking these systems. And uh -huh. it's important. And again, like I was saying, it's all at the same time. And it's, it's not all one, then the next, then the next. It is it is all one one thing. It, it does seem to have avalanched. Yeah, <laughs> in the past couple of years. I don't know if that's a if that's a verb, but uh, now it is. Oh, now it but, is. Uh, yeah, it just it, it it seems to be growing, and and that's uh, there's there's absolutely nothing bad about that. So let's just hope it just it just keeps on going. Absolutely. I'll, um, maybe take us into your final performance. Oh yeah, I thought I thought for a little fun, um, I'll just put on these ankle bells. Um, I do a lot <laughs> we'll of. Wait for uh, you. <laughs> I do a lot of uh, ethnic music actually as well. Um, uh, it's particularly stuff from Eastern Europe, um, Jewish, Balkan, 
um, and Roma music. And this is a, a little tune partly from Romania and partly from my head, um, which since I don't have a sort of a gypsy band here with the bass player and the, and the tambourine, I'm, I'm gonna do the tambourine myself with my foot so that I am somewhat accompanied. And uh, yeah, it's just a little tune from Oltenia. I wanna yeah. wait before you go, before you go, before you do that. I, I wanna know if there's anything else you'd like for us to know mm -hmm. that you'd like to leave us with because you, you are a person who has a lot of reason not to be hopeful, to continue to be angry, to have perhaps lost your voice, to be depressed, to not participate. And at the same time, you are participating in as many ways as you can. And, and I wanna know what, what your impetus is for that and what we might be able to share from you with people who are watching and listening to this, who may be depressed right now, who may also have a story that they've not told, mm -hmm. who are looking for tools and for ways to stay present and to say, here's one more day that I can, I can be here and continue to sort this out, continue to try. Well, make, make no mistake. I mean, I, I, I put lipstick on and, you know, uh, obviously I'm smiling and stuff, but I, you know, it, it, this is, I've, today is a good day. Yesterday was a good day, but um, although I do, like I said before, try to stay positive, um, I am no stranger to depression and to just times when I start getting dreads because I haven't brushed my hair for a week. And you know, I mean, everybody's got that, those weeks, especially right now. Um, and there's no magic solution. I didn't have a magic solution. I just like sort of forced myself to do certain things and somehow that helps, you know, like even one day it would be like, okay, I'm just gonna clean this like corner of this room. And, and even like tiny little things would help. And especially lately um, it's been just don't, I've been trying not to get angry at myself for not having written the second King Lear, for not having learned like two concertos that I've commissioned, you know, no, I haven't done that. I haven't maybe accomplished as much as I would have without COVID, without some depression. But I, I think it really does begin with the little things and also with, with kind of self-honesty. Mm -hmm. When I started speaking to the Enquirer um, almost two years ago now, it, uh, I mean, I, I was just astonished at like the, the sort of physical things that were happening, like uh, things were just sort of coming out <laughs> in, in strange ways. And, and, and sometimes, you know, you just, I was finally being honest with myself, I think, after all these years, after 34 years of, of, of kind of an illness. And I don't know. So if, if, if my being able to do this can help anybody else, even just telling a shrink or a parent or a husband or, 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 or a wife, um, you know, it's, it's, it's important to say it's not, it's not only women, but yes, mostly, but uh, obviously in the music world, there's, there's all sorts of, um, of, of, of stuff against young men as well. But, um, but I don't know, the little things and just that one little glimmer of positivity seems to help me. Great. It's not magic, but <laughs> anyways, here's a little tune from Oltenia which is just south of Transylvania.
<laughs> that. <laughs> That was amazing. <laughs> a little bit of fun. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, we are we are so grateful to have you here, and I just want to let people listening know that um, they can hear you in the key of A. So I encourage them to go out and buy that recording. Um, I think our team is going to put it on the link. Uh, it's Fabulous. it's something that everybody should hear. And um, here is to every single day and no magic, but just keeping on trying. And we are grateful for you. Thank you so much. Thank you You're for having incredible. me. Thank you and so to, much. Yes. <laughs> and to those listening, join, Hel uh, join Helga and I next Friday with Jennifer Walsh, an comp incredible composer and uh, futurist in technology. Thank you, Lara. Thank you. Take care. Thanks so much.